Okay, I'm going to talk about machines, which seems like a large break from the previous um, talk, but bear with me. So when we're talking about machines that make things, um, there's a history for that, um, where they came from. This is at MIT in 1952, or and a little bit before, the first time they hooked up a milling machine to a computer. Um, and the cool thing about that is that the computer can control the machine instead of you manually having to turn and move it around, uh, ushering a new era of precision and the ability to make complex parts, um, but also creating uh, the basis of what later would become the technology that we use for controlling 3D printers or other kinds of digital fabrication. And so if you go to uh, Apple's factory right now in uh, Washington, they employ uh, these technologies, so all computer-controlled mills, at a massive scale um, to create precisely fabricated computers, or the enclosures of your iPhone. Um, and that's the same thing over and over again. Uh, at the Center for Bits and Atoms, one of the things that we've been facilitating is personal access to um, computer numeric control. So this is a fab lab in Iceland where uh, kids can come and use digital fabrication machines. So you can imagine that a fab lab, has, have any of you been in a fab lab before? Some of you? Yeah, a few. So it's like, kind of like a library, but instead of books, you have machines. And so instead of reading, you can produce things. Um, and uh, it's actually been a, a really successful way of introducing the means of production so that people can start doing personal fabrication. Instead of everyone the same phone or everyone the same computer, people can start making their own solutions for their own kinds of problems with Fab Labs. And the means of production, though, is not the only thing that's changing. Uh, this is a marketplace in Shenzhen, so we're going to go from the U.S. in 1950 to south of China uh, last year. This is a, it looks like a regular marketplace where you just buy, you know, eggs and vegetables, but actually uh, this marketplace sells LEDs and motors. For nerds like me, it's kind of like heaven. You go everywhere and you can buy all this stuff. Um, and each one of these stalls is not just selling the things that they have there, but they represent factories that they can go back to. So you can start customizing the parts that you need. Um, the potentiometer that you wanted to buy has a red LED in it, and you actually wanted a green LED. Five minutes later, they'll give it to you. Um, and so I buy parts there for machines that I build, but I also buy these other things. These are phones that I collect from Shenzhen. Uh, and each one of these seems kind of silly, right? So on the bottom right here, that's an iPhone 8. It's about half the size of an iPhone 7, and it runs Android. <laughs> there's a, uh, the Hermes handbag cell phone. Um, there's the Prashi kind of Lamborghini-like cell phone. And each one of these is kind of tacky, right? And they're all around $10, $20. Um, and maybe it's not necessarily that exciting. Why would I want to have all of these silly phones? But to me, this establishes system integration where someone had to make the circuit board to fit in these phones. Someone made the operating system and branded it Hermes. And uh, you have these die cast parts. That kind of system integration at this kind of volume, volume that's never intended for mass market, not everyone is going to walk around with one of these, means that the means of production next to these kinds of material productions enables all kinds of crazy things. Um, but that's not exactly what people are making in Fab Labs yet. And so sometimes I wonder, why, why is that the case? And actually, if you use some of the machines, these digital fabrication machines, they're not totally well suited yet for just anyone to walk up to and use. This is actually um, not a machine from 1950. It's a machine from last year. But you still have to be able to run it using this extremely user-friendly interface. <laughs> and uh, one, of the, one of the groups that I work with is at NASA Ames. We work on shape-shifting wings. So you're making wings for space in the future. Um, but this is the machine, that, the milling machine, that they use to produce those parts. And if you recognize it, this milling machine is actually exactly the same model as is in that popular science article from 1952. The only difference is that it's updated with this fancy new operating system. You don't have to control it with punch cards anymore. So what is the future now? Are machines going to continue looking like this, or do they need to change entirely? Um, and so I explore 
What does it look like to have personal digital fabrication? This is a machine I built with Alain Moyer, which is a pop-up milling machine and also a 3D printer. And one of the funny things about this machine is I bring it on the airplane and no one asks any questions. So that's just one imagination of a machine that, what does it look like to have a laptop of digital fabrication instead of a mainframe? Um, and at MIT, I teach the class how to make something that makes almost anything, which is only about machine building. So instead of the 3D printer being the universal machine for everyone, can you make custom machines for whatever the process or application is that you envision? So liquid handling machines for pipetting, or uh, five-axis control machines for cutting foams, or uh, desktop wire EDMs. And to be able to do this, I develop uh, infrastructure for machine building to make it easier to do each time so that you're not doing everything from scratch. These are networks controls where if you want to augment your machine with another motor or another end effector, instead of having to redesign your board, you just add another control node to a control network. Um, and also doing that mechanically, instead of saying every time you design a motion system that you have to design the entire mechanics in one go, you can say, can I add motion in the same way I add Lego pieces to structures? Um, so that each machine is just an instantiation of modules, where you have control modules and mechanical modules and software parts that together form an application-specific machine. Well, so this is great. For me, I build lots of fancy machines all of the time, um, but I'm actually also interested in not just engineers like me uh, who go to uh, fancy places and work with people to make fancy machines. Um, so I have access to these modules, but I wanted to know if it was possible for other people to start building these machines as well. And so together um, with my colleague James Coleman, we decided to make a construction kit for machines that were all built out of cardboard. So cardboard is a laser cut so that you score it precisely to make the right form. And to start with, we taught this machine building class in the global network of Fab Labs um, all around the world. So everywhere they started making different kinds of machines, like a calligraphy machine or drawing machines. This is a 3D scanner that uses the iPhone as the input device. Um, but also other machines, like this is a coffee stirring machine uh, or a light show machine. Uh, this machine, for example, has uh, five degrees of freedom. It's typically, for application engineers, adding more degrees of freedom is hard. But for them, they don't know that there's a history of adding a fourth and fifth degree that is complicated. They're just like, yeah, just add another node to the network. It's simple. Um, this is a lathe. This is a precision ketchup application machine. <laughs> and a cocktail mixing machine. You find that when people start making machines that are application specific, a lot of people care deeply about food and drinking. <laughs> um, this one is also from Japan. Japan has a lot of weird machines. Uh, this is a, a cutting machine. But you see, they got the whole machine, the software, everything works. The part that was difficult was 
rigidly attaching the knife such that it cuts all the way through. And so these are all people that uh, aren't engineering students or there are people that are spending time in fab labs to build these kinds of things. Um, and so being able to use the system integration of a modular system to quickly finish something is a great way to have like this success experience and then be able to do the next prototype. This is a bleach application machine so that you can write on t-shirts. And then this is a uh, sand gardening machine for computer controlled zen. That wasn't the only place. There was a sand gardening machine from Ohio, and this is a sand gardening machine from Italy. So what I learned from this was that sand gardening has more global appeal than you really knew about. And that might seem kind of frivolous. You know, all of these machines, none of them necessarily seem to be solving any kind of really important question. Um, but when you can do things that are frivolous, like the phones that I showed you in the beginning, which are frivolous, or these machines that are frivolous, that also means that it's easy. And so, if it's easy now to build machines to make almost anything, and it's easy to do low-volume production, what are all the possibilities that you can imagine? You know, if, if the power uh, to make machines is now here, what are all the things that we can do with that? So, thank you very much.